Well, it is indeed good to be here again. And um, for this, I owe a big thanks to Becky Stokes uh, for having the idea that I might come back and uh, do a talk here, and to Kay Taylor uh, for inviting me here. And I could not have written this book had I not lived here and worked in the um, space business in the 1980s. And for that, I owe gratitude to Rick Chappell and to Ed Pruitt, who hired me as a fresh PhD with a background in American literature and American history of the 19th century. And uh, they somehow thought I might be able to write about science and technology in the 20th century. And uh, they were very good mentors to me and truly enabled my career. So um, I owe a huge debt of gratitude uh, to them and uh, to people like Harry Kraft, uh, who was a mission manager for Space Lab missions, and, and a lot of other good people at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, I grew up during the early part of the space era, and I watched with great interest the movement of humans out into space as a child, uh, but by no means was I trained in what it takes to go into space. And uh, I learned a lot about that while I lived here in Huntsville. And uh, this book, uh, to me, is kind of the culmination of my career because my career did correspond directly with the space shuttle era. Uh, I started working in 1980 here, and um, I was still working when the space shuttle retired in 2012, and was, Discovery was delivered to the Smithsonian. Uh, and I had this book in mind for a long time, and I wanted to write something that was different, uh, that, that took me more back to my roots as a person trained in history and literature and study of the arts. Uh, my my uh, graduate degree was in American Studies, which is the study of American culture from, from many different angles, actually. And my angle happened to be a uh, history of ideas in American culture. And those ideas, as they were expressed in literature, uh, in public policy, and in the fine arts. And I think spaceflight is exactly that kind of topic uh, for a student of American culture to uh, want to understand better. Uh, I knew a fair amount about the missions and the operations, uh, but I wanted to ask some bigger questions about why are we involved in space flight? What has it meant? Uh, has that meaning changed over time? Uh, how is the meaning changed? And as a writer and editor for NASA and an occasional speech writer, I knew that words matter, and that when NASA is writing public information materials, uh, they spend a lot of time crafting the message, getting the words just right to communicate the idea about the worth and value of a scientific mission, or uh, about the intended outcomes, uh, the hoped for benefits. Uh, so I, I knew that that was going on behind the scenes because I had been part of it, but I wanted to research it as a professional historian and learn more about it. And so this book is the result of that effort. And what I'd like to do tonight is just run quickly through the illustrations in the book uh, that I think serve as entree points to a broader discussion of ideas and meanings. Uh, the book was originally titled by me uh, in my working title as uh, Spaceflight in the Shuttle Era, Ideas, Images, and Icons. And the publisher didn't think that was quite the right title. So the publisher selected uh, In the Shuttle Era and Beyond, Redefining Humanity's Purpose in Space. And it turns out that that really is an apt title, because that's kind of what I was wrestling with the whole time. 
And um, my um, thesis was that spaceflight in the shuttle era had a much different meaning than it did in the 1960s, that that meaning was consciously, deliberately crafted and promoted and uh, it was the organizing uh, principle for space flight in the shuttle era, but it did not stay static either. It changed as circumstances changed and as new programs were introduced and uh, that we're in yet a different era now, about which I'm not sure the message is crystal clear yet. I, I know what the current message is, but I don't yet have confidence that we're going to be able to follow through with it. And I have long suspected that the themes or the ideas from the early space program were particularly resonant with people of uh, my generation and just a little bit older and a little bit younger based on the culture we grew up in but that the meaning and purpose of spaceflight in the future could be much different to people who are born in the 21st century, uh, to the millennials and whoever follows the millennials, because they have grown up in a very different culture. Um, so that's, uh, that's my introduction and, uh, uh, and my argument, my thesis, and. Uh, uh, we'll see at the end of the talk if I have persuaded you or if you want to take issue uh, with me, and either way is fine. Uh, I'm certainly open to discussion and dialogue. Um, and I'd like to start first by reading you one uh, paragraph or so from the book that helps set the context for this study. Um, how many of us are familiar with the word imaginary? And what do we think of as imaginary? Figments of our imagination, perhaps, things that are made up, uh, that are fictional. Um, we think of imaginary as an adjective, but there's another meaning of imaginary as a noun, and I use that term in my book. And imaginary is a synonym for belief, or tradition, or uh, narrative, uh, even myth, um, in the ways that people who study literature and history talk about uh, myth. But an imaginary um, is it's a construct of ideas based on or growing out of the culture in which you live. And it often is things that you just take for granted as knowledge because you've always heard them. You don't know where they came from. But that imaginary uh, is the framework by which you interpret some parts of the reality that you live in. And um, so if you'll indulge me for just a moment, I'll read a paragraph or so to give you a, a little bit more familiarity with the term. And then we'll move into the, um, the rest of the talk. Let me make sure I can find it again. Okay. This is the first book talk I've done actually reading for my book. So, uh, space flight is an invention. Nothing about it is natural, except perhaps the urge to explore. It is an activity first imagined and then engineered and executed at great effort and expense. Space flight is a cultural product of human imagination, intelligence, and will. To make sense, it needs a narrative that explains its purpose and value. To borrow a popular term in recent social and cultural studies, spaceflight is an imaginary, a big idea expressed in meaningful narratives, images, symbols, and actions that represent shared beliefs and values. 
among the many imaginaries that pervade American culture with a sense of identity and shared experience are the West, the melting pot, the American dream, the Cold War, and even democracy itself. A more abstract imaginary is American exceptionalism, the belief that the United States is unique in history and has a special destiny to spread freedom, advance technology, and ensure progress for humanity. Uh, so, so all of these are part of our common intellectual framework. Uh, they're part of our tradition. They're part of our sense of identity as Americans. And they've grown up over years, decades, and even centuries. So what I'm trying to do is insert spaceflight into that kind of framework and think about it as um, an imaginary. And so I said I would use some of the images from the book to talk about this. Okay, so we'll start with this, um, this concept of space flight in the 1950s, that space exploration and space flight was thought of in terms that are quite understandable, uh, given that the world had just emerged uh, from a long and taxing war, and space was a new place. And in the uneasiness in the aftermath of war, it was very easy to think about space as a place that needed to be conquered, um, both uh, literally and metaphorically. And if you look at writings about space in that period, this kind of militaristic um, concept dominates in the words and the images that you see. Space would be a high ground for potential military action, and whoever got into space first would have an advantage over everyone else, because space could be used as a place uh, to launch weapons, to uh, uh, have spy platforms, reconnaissance systems. Uh, space was a place that could make the world a less safe place to live in, and of course this concept is at the very heart of the space race uh, that we experienced during the 1960s. Uh, but these are just a couple of images uh, from that period. Uh, you, uh, those of you familiar with the Collier's Magazine series of the 1950s will recognize the cover, Man Will Conquer Space Soon. And uh, for all his visionary thought about moving out into space as explorers, Von Braun also thought very seriously about how space might be used for military purposes or how the U.S. must prevent space from being used for military purposes. So we have this initial imaginary of uh, space as a potentially threatening place, uh, a place to be uh, wary of, cautious of, a place that we needed to figure out how to go to and how to uh, prevent anyone who was uh, an adversary from going to. And you know enough about the history of the late 1950s and the shock value of the Sputnik launch and the uh, response here in the United States of uh, the, a, a sense of urgency that the United States must get into space too, must not allow it to be conquered by uh, a hostile force. So that's kind of where we started, and that idea certainly carried over into the um, early 1960s and with the selection of the first astronauts uh, who were among our best pilots from our military services. Uh, people often speak of them as our space warriors. Uh, they were selected to uh, help get the United States into space and defend us from this uh, hostile adversary, and they even had special uniforms uh, that made them look like, uh, made them look different from uh, the military uh, uniforms that they had worn, but they, that they had worn, and they were not actually publicized very much as 
members of the military. Uh, they were, after all, in a civilian space program. But nevertheless, they came out of that Cold War and post-war culture and uh, had no doubt about the political import of what they were about to do. And um, as I said, that carried over into uh, the early 60s, but with President Kennedy, we had the introduction of uh, a related imaginary um, in that it came out of American history, American culture and tradition, and it also came out of the theme that he had established for his presidential campaign, and you'll see one of his posters here uh, talking about the new frontier. And he very often talked about space as the new frontier, the new ocean, a beckoning place, uh, not so much a threatening place, but a beckoning one that had the same appeal uh, to that generation and to our nation as the West had had um, in the previous century. And there's probably few imaginaries in American thought and American life more powerful than the frontier. Um, and particularly, again, for the generation that launched our space program, uh, though they grew up watching um, uh, cartoons and reading comic books about Buck Rogers and, and uh, other space figures, figures venturing out into the uh, solar system and beyond. They also had grown up playing cowboys and Indians and playing with forts and with um, uh, wearing cowboy boots and cowboy hats. And, uh, you know, every little boy in the 50s probably wanted to be a cowboy out west. Um, school textbooks in that era had titles like The Frontiers of American History. And uh, then you look at the television programs in the 1960s, and there were Westerns all over on every channel, very popular. So we were steeped in this frontier culture, uh, Western ideas in the 1960s at the time that the space race was ramping up. And um, Kennedy uh, definitely had a sense that space was more than an attractive frontier. It was also a place that we Americans needed to move out in. Uh, if anybody was going to move into space, we Americans should, because that kind of movement was part of our history. And he went further to say, and if we're going to move out into space, we need to lead it. We need to be first. We need to win it. I don't know that he ever used the actual term space race, but that's about as close as he came to talking about space as a competition. And some of you may know, though, that behind the scenes, he was making overtures uh, to Nikita Khrushchev about trying to do some kind of activity together in space to demonstrate cooperation and to make the space frontier a place that was safe both for the Soviets and for the Americans. So I don't think he was wedded to the conquest of space uh, of the 50s, I think he was moving toward a new imaginary that was less fearful and more positive uh, about uh, this kind of innate urge to explore, to move, and all the benefits that accrued uh, to a country that could demonstrate that kind of achievement and that kind of uh, technological prowess. Um, he was certainly very well aware of the political value of that in the Cold War environment and thought that great achievements in space would help to win the hearts and minds of men to the kinds of freedoms that we joy, enjoy in American democracy. Um, so that those were ideas behind this. And uh, he made a real show of his commitment to uh, the space 
program and to this ideal of moving out into the new frontier by visiting here in Huntsville, by visiting um, in Houston, by going to Kennedy Space Center, uh, by uh, having a personal relationship uh, with Von Brown and others, um, and by generously funding NASA. So um, this, I think, is, is the beginning of the imaginary that dominated throughout then the 1960s and into the early 70s when we completed the landings on the moon. And it was not just Kennedy's words, but uh, the media followed all of this closely, and they provided the images and the icons that embodied these ideas. And um, what is more impactful than being on the cover of Time or Life magazine uh, back in the day? And if you, if you read these images, uh, they so clearly are communicating American success, American triumph, and the subtext there is uh, American freedom and America's presence in this new frontier. And in fact, the pose over there on the far right for you is very much like the pose that has been struck by explorers from time immemorial when they land on new shores or they climb the highest mountain or they claim territory for the king or queen. Uh, there is always the flag and there is always this uh, heroic posture. Uh, directly behind me, of course, you see the embodiment of the idea of the space race taken very literally. And if you look at it closely, it's hard to tell in that image who is ahead given the perspective of the illustration. And you'll notice that the two figures are essentially identical except for the badges they wear on their shoulders. And, and so you get this sense of, of um, not just national competition, but of a kind of human striving uh, to move out. And uh, at the time this uh, was published, it, it was, um, I think it was December of 1968, it really was neck and neck. And uh, uh, it was not until July then that the life, July of 69, that the life and the other time uh, covers could appear. So, so here we see images that reinforce those ideas and uh, those images have become iconic. We always think of a man standing on the moon with the U.S. flag as the embodiment of winning the space race and moving human beings off the planet to another body in the solar system. Uh, we always think of these images as the embodiment of moving out to a new frontier. Uh, but after the um, Apollo program, actually even before the Apollo program of missions to the moon ended, NASA was already thinking, what do we do next? Uh, how do we continue to use this national resource that we have created? And um, there seemed to be no political taste for continuing missions to the moon. Uh, so NASA had to scramble to come up with some other ideas of what to do with our space program. And this planning had started in the late 1960s, and all of you know the story, I'm sure, as well as I do, about uh, the decision to try to move toward a space station and a shuttle vehicle that could carry people back and forth from uh, Earth to Earth orbit. And in the original NASA plan of 1959, the NASA strategic plan, that actually preceded missions to the moon. And in the urgency of the Cold War environment, President Kennedy switched the order. So NASA decided to go back to the strategic plan, um, iterated that again in 1969, 
could not get money to do both a space station and a space shuttle simultaneously, so decided to start with the shuttle uh, to lay the uh, groundwork for a space station, to get the vehicle operating that would make it possible then to build a space station in Earth orbit and to uh, carry crews back and forth and supplies and other things. And so uh, this is where we really see the deliberate rethinking of the spaceflight imaginary because um, in the Public Affairs Office, office says actually at the NASA centers and in the highest leadership offices at NASA headquarters, they were working on uh, public information materials that would convey the idea of a new era. Uh, they were accepting that they would not be doing spaceflight the same way, it would be a new era, and the theme of that new era was going to be space transportation. And um, we see it here in a NASA publication, and we see it here again on the cover of Time Magazine. You can almost do the history of the space shuttle program using Time Magazine covers. Um, but that's how they welcomed Columbia back uh, from its first mission, winging into a new era. And all the journalists uh, of the time picked up on this theme from the time that uh, Enterprise was introduced in 1976 out in California through the time of Columbia's flight and beyond. Uh, the main chorus was a new era in space. And the notes in that chorus uh, included these. This was going to be routine space flight. It was going to be regular space flight. It was going to be practical and useful space flight. It was going to be beneficial um, in different ways than uh, space flight in the 1960s had been. This new era was going to be an era of commuting into space. It was just going to become part of our national life, and the shuttle would make all of this possible. And uh, again, uh, the media picked up on this in editorials and heralded it um, as um, kind of turning over to a new chapter. And that dominated the thinking. And at the very beginning, they were really thinking of the space shuttle very much like you would think of an airliner. And the editorial cartoon on the right captures this idea of routine flight. It's a timetable of, of shuttle flights coming back and forth very much like an airliner. And um, it was called a space plane, which obviously it looks like, so why not call it that? So this whole imaginary is kind of wrapped up in the idea of airline transportation. And at, at some point it changed slightly. Um, well, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, I've had these posters and had the blue one on my office door for years and years. I love these posters because part of the idea of commuting to space was the idea of going to work in space. And this also connotes the idea that space flight is going to be uh, practical, useful, routine. Um, it's not necessarily going to be glamorous and adventurous. It's going to be in Earth orbit. We're going to be staying in the same place, but we'll learn a lot there, and that will enable us eventually uh, to go farther out. But in the 1960s, we were destination driven. In the 1970s and 80s and into the 90s, we were stay close to home driven. And uh, it was really about going to work in space. And uh, the astronauts took this very seriously themselves and often on missions uh, adopted that role of commuting to work in space. And a couple of the images may be a little bit small, but you can see some astronauts behind me holding straps like you would hold in a subway or a commuter train. Or we have astronauts wearing hard hats uh, for a shuttle mission. Or we have astronauts making up names for their mission and designating themselves as a satellite delivery company or 
ace repair and servicing company so they really got into the spirit of going to work in space and of course in the shuttle era astronaut corps we had people who were engineers and scientists as well as pilots and the shuttle was designed to do a lot of different kinds of work so all of this kind of comes together in this same imaginary of routine commuting into space. Uh, and at some point, though, early on, the symbol for the shuttle changed from an airplane to a truck. And I don't know exactly when that happened, but this is one of the, the first uh, headlines I've seen calling it a truck. And again, you could pretty well tell the history of the shuttle era by looking at editorial cartoons because they were right on top of everything all the time, sometimes affectionately and sometimes not so affectionately. But the uh, political cartoonists were very much attuned to the space program during this era. Um, and I suspect this change happened when uh, we got beyond the first uh, test flights of the space shuttle and started delivering satellites into orbit. And that's when, instead of thinking of the shuttle as a freight-carrying aircraft, people started thinking of it as a truck. NASA itself started calling it America's space truck. The National Air and Space Museum had an exhibit in Space Hall called America's Space Truck. Uh, so you can see how an idea like that catches on and uh, flows and becomes kind of part of the accepted knowledge. In this case, I think not really intentionally. Whoops. Oh, <laughs> well, guess what else was happening in the early 1980s? Um, trucks were seeing huge advances in sales, both pickup trucks and big rigs. And who doesn't love a truck? How many of you all have a truck or have had a truck? You know, Americans have a love affair with trucks. And uh, I think it's a very interesting. I did some, some research looking into truck sales in the uh, early 1980s, and they really were reaching peaks. That's probably just coincidental, but it kind of fits with something else about America and, and, and our culture and what we love. I've been listening to a lot of Garth Brooks lately, and he has a lot of songs about pickup trucks and what you can do in a pickup truck and, you know, how a pickup truck is a guy's best friend or his most cherished possession. And uh, I think that's still true today. Lots of people like pickup trucks. And, of course, um, there is a kind of fascination, too, with these big rigs as well. Um, I think I might have accidentally missed one slide, so I'm going to go back. Or it's, I thought I had another one with more cartoons. Maybe it's coming up. Or, oh, I know probably what the problem is. They were really big files. Let's just hang here for a moment and see if they appear. Anyway, what they were were other editorial cartoons of the shuttle as a truck. Um, we saw the cartoon of the shuttle as a moving van, and then we saw the um, cartoon of, um, there's another cartoon of the shuttle as a tow truck, another one of it as a maintenance and servicing truck, and yet another one of it as a truck stop. Uh, with vending machines and all that sort of thing. So the editorial cartoonists were having a good time playing with that idea. And uh, I guess it is natural to think of a truck if you're thinking about hauling big things, uh, making deliveries, uh, capturing big things, making repairs, bringing things home, uh, and that sort of thing. And here are some, some uh, images of you know, the size of the payload bay of the shuttle and certainly the Hubble Space Telescope. These cartoons appeared before the Hubble was launched, but, but the Hubble is certainly a great example of how the space shuttle could be a truck. And NASA and the astronauts for a while adopted this motto, we deliver. And you can see a NASA publication behind me that's all about uh, these services that uh, the shuttle offers. 
and um, about the uh, capabilities of that vehicle. Here are the other cartoons. They weren't where I thought they were. Um, and, and they're humorous. And there, there have been many, many cartoons like this. So you know that something is permeating the culture if it's being depicted that way so many times. Uh, I got the idea uh, to wonder whether toy manufacturers had kind of picked up on the space shuttle. And um, I did some research on that, and it turns out essentially every toy maker in the United States made some version of a space shuttle, and some of them for very young children. This happens to be a slide of um, space shuttles in our collection uh, that I found on eBay. And it's Fisher Price, it's all the different makers. And uh, in particular, you'll notice here is a set of bathtub toys in the shape of a shuttle. And think about that. Manufacturers are marketing the shuttle to children who are too young to talk. But they see this as something essential in our culture, and they probably also see it as a sort of entree point for some other toys as the children grow older. And indeed, you can see a spectrum of shuttles here. You can imagine uh, little children playing with. Uh, as the market developed more shuttles, they became more complex, smaller, and of course, uh, kind of culminated in such things as very highly detailed models and uh, radio control shuttles and that sort of thing. So we have space flight leaking out into the marketplace and the toys are marketed as being educational, as uh, helping you stimulate your child's interests in science and technology and also being aware of what the nation is doing in space. Um, the other thing uh, that happened in the shuttle era, of course, is not only was there a new imaginary about the purpose of space flight, but NASA basically reinvented the astronaut corps for this new era and brought into the astronaut corps new kinds of workers, um, in, in addition to the pilot astronauts who had always been there. Uh, they brought in engineers, medical doctors, veterinarians, scientists in the various disciplines of space science. And these were the people who were going to be the worker bees on the space shuttle actually carrying out the mission as mission specialists. The pilots had responsibility to fly the vehicle, keep it safe in orbit, but the mission specialist and then some other uh, astronauts who were guest or temporary astronauts called payload specialists would do the work. That was a reinvention of the astronaut corps and then in response to changing social mores and pressures, NASA decided to open up the astronaut corps to women and members of minority groups who had not been able to qualify as pilots. So creating this new category of mission specialists essentially expanded the pool of eligible people and enabled the selection of six women in 1960, uh, 1978 and three African Americans. And obviously they became instant celebrities, instant heroes within their communities, um, particularly the women more so than the African Americans. But if you look at Jet Magazine and, and uh, some of the other um, black magazines from that era, they were following very closely uh, the African-American astronauts and holding them up as role models for their community. Most of us probably don't read Jet Magazine, so we didn't realize the kind of attention they were getting within uh, their demographic. Uh, but certainly um, Time, Newsweek, Ms. Magazine, uh, Good Housekeeping, Ladies Home Journal, McCall's, Reader's Digest, everybody had to do an article about the women in the astronaut corps. And the net result of this was not only did the astronaut corps expand and broaden, but it became more diverse. And uh, some crews in particular 
remarkably illustrated that diversity, not only in backgrounds, uh, but in um, ethnic identity, in um, religious background, in, in every way. Uh, over the years, every population has, has become represented with at least one astronaut, except probably uh, the Alaskan indigenous people. We've had Asian Pacific Americans, we've had a Native American, we've had uh, Buddhist, Hindu, Jews, Christians. Um, we've had uh, people who came from privileged backgrounds. We've had astronauts who were the offspring of migrant workers or who grew up on social welfare and public assistance. Uh, uh, once, once the core was broadened out, um, and people of merit and capability from all backgrounds were able to enter. It really did democratize uh, the astronaut corps, not perfectly, but, but certainly more so than in the past. And that was another symptom of the new era. And uh, it's surprising, but when President Richard Nixon announced that we would go forward with building a space shuttle, and his speech had been largely written by someone at NASA. So it had all those words, routine. We're going to take the uh, astronomical cost out of spaceflight. It will be more economical. He said, we will have a vehicle on which men and women can go into space. And uh, that, was, that was the first time in a public arena like that uh, that had been acknowledged that women would become eligible. He made that speech in 1972, and they were finally selected in 1978. Um, okay, once we had scientists and engineers um, in the astronaut corps, and uh, we had people busy delivering satellites and uh, doing engineering kind of tasks, we could also take advantage of the scientists and start doing research in the space shuttle. And, uh, after the Challenger accident, um, basically all the satellites remaining in the queue were launched fairly quickly um, in 1989 and the early 1990s, and shuttle missions began to shift heavily over into research. And uh, the astronaut corps was primed to do this. And during this period, before um, a space station was approved, NASA essentially used the space shuttle as a miniature and temporary space station and ran uh, fully equipped laboratories into space with crews working around the clock doing research in uh, probably up to 10 different disciplines, life science, material science, astronomy, astrophysics, earth observations, earth science, um, basic physics, uh, physics of fluids, physics of crystals. Um, it was a, a time of very rich exploration of what kind of science could be done in microgravity and what could be learned without the dominant influence of gravity on these different experiments. Uh, tremendously fertile time, and some of these missions were very multidisciplinary. Some of them were devoted to a single discipline, like life science. The last of the space lab missions was devoted specifically to studies of the brain and nervous system uh, to exploit the microgravity environment for that. And a lot of this work was managed out of Marshall. Space Flight Center Marshall was the lead center for the space lab missions. So the mission specialists did a lot of their training here. Uh, Rick Chappell was a mission scientist and also a payload specialist candidate for one of the research missions. Uh, I would say the 1990s was really the heyday for science on the space shuttle as a precursor to building uh, a space station to learn the processes and the benefits to fly experiments over and over again and figure out how to get the most out of them and really to prepare the scientific community for an eventual space station. Uh, 
And it was in this same period of time. Oh, this, I threw this in for fun because there was one, one mission that became kind of notorious, the third Space Lab mission, that was the first shuttle mission to have animals on board. And the editorial cartoonist had a lot of fun with this, too. And here you see the animals waiting and wondering, when is the next mission for those who didn't get on the first flight? And there was a problem on that mission where the animal holding facility was not quite as airtight as advertised, and some particulate matter escaped through cracks uh, or through seams in the holding facility. And uh, the crew were not very happy about that, particularly the commander was not happy. But, but the mission specialists stayed on duty, did their job, cleaned up after the little animals. And I always think of uh, astronaut uh, Bill Thornton when I see this cartoon because he took it as his personal mission to make sure that the uh, two little monkeys and the 24 rats survived and ha had a good trip home. Uh, um, but uh, during the period of time then that the shuttle is shifting over to scientific missions, NASA as a whole is shifting over to the next logical step, and that was the paradigm for thinking about the space station. Uh, if you have a vehicle, um, it, it needs to serve an orbital place, and a space station is the next logical step. And so uh, the administrator of NASA then in the mid-1980s took it as his personal mission to get President Reagan to approve a space station. And so the literature coming out of NASA then had a very strong focus on space station as the next logical step. That phrase was in everything that um, the administrator said when he talked to Congress, when he talked to the White House, to the Office of Management and Budget. There was a, a task force in-house at NASA headquarters with a speechwriter and a um, communications director making sure that all the communiques coming out of the White House aligned with this because this was the new uh, imaginary, the new priority. And, uh, of course, the first incarnation of that was called Space Station Freedom. There had been a couple of previous designs, but the one that President Reagan approved was a concept called Freedom, and it uh, lasted for about four to five years, but it had a tortured history of going through repeated redesigns and scalebacks and redesigns and scalebacks because Congress just couldn't get on board with it enough. So here again, we have uh, a wonderful editorial cartoon of somebody commenting, oh, that's a nice model of the space station on your desk. And the, the uh, manager there, I guess, says, model, <laughs> that is the space station. It, it just gives you a sense of how fraught it was in the late 1980s and early 1990s before the go-ahead finally came. And then I'm kind of skipping over this. I'm not going to go into the whole building of the space station because I'm really talking about the shuttle imaginary. But after the Columbia tragedy, um, this vehicle, it, th some of this had happened after the Challenger tragedy. Um, critics arose and started calling it the wrong vehicle, a flawed vehicle. Uh, some, a, a dead end, a wrong term, something that the United States shouldn't have in invested in, uh, despite the remarkable record of its successes. So, um, really, Challenger, the Challenger tragedy um, energized critics to a higher level of criticism than they had had before. And the uh, Columbia tragedy. Uh, basically caused much the same and led to an early announcement uh, that the shuttle program would end as soon as the space station was completed. But in the, the perception of the editorial cartoonist and the critics, the Columbia accident made them think that the vehicles were derelict, uh, that they were aged beyond utility, uh, that they should be retired immediately, that they were unsafe at any speed, 
there was uh, just a huge chorus of criticism about them. And for me, uh, this cartoon of discovery was politically, uh, was personally um, very painful because I was already hoping that the museum would receive discovery someday and to see it depicted this way you know, as an uh, invalid, basically, uh, was very hurtful. But there were a whole lot of other cartoons similar in kind. And so there was a shift in thinking about the space shuttle in the community at large, though not so much within NASA, though there were pockets within NASA of thinking that it's time to retire this vehicle, even though the vehicles were all essentially as new as they had been on the day they were delivered because of all their maintenance uh, and repair and upgrades and such. So all the shuttles had a lot more life in them, but they only got to serve out for about six more years. Um, and uh, cartoonists were already looking at this uh, probable future of the space shuttle for ending up in museums. And that brings us then to yet a new mindset about space flight after we've talked about these other purposes of it. Uh, space flight in the shuttle era ended on a note of nostalgia and memory, uh, a, a, a real sense that we have to preserve the memory of this era because time is passing by, something new is going to come on, it's not going to be the same thing, it will probably have a new purpose. So how do we capture for the future what was accomplished in the shuttle era? And we all have our own personal memories, but there's obviously such a thing as public memory as well. And museums are largely the stewards of public memory um, in the ways that we present American history and the material culture of our history. And certainly as the National Museum of Air and Space, uh, we decided early on that our presentation would focus on the successes and accomplishments of the shuttle era as our dominant focus, we would certainly recognize um, the accidents and we would admit to some of the promises that were not achieved, but we wanted to preserve in public memory what really was a remarkable 30 years of space flight that became very nearly routine. It didn't become routine with as frequent flights as NASA originally projected, but those projections were very, very optimistic. But when you look at a, an era where uh, on some years we flew nine missions a year, the missions lasted up to two weeks, we launched 30 missions to build a space station that is as large as a football field and all the parts fit together and they had never been made it together on Earth before because they came from Europe and Japan and Canada and the Soviet Union. Uh, it's really a, a, a tale of remarkable achievement. So, so we chose to memorialize uh, that aspect of shuttle history. And then Kennedy Space Center has done a very, very brave and moving thing. Uh, they certainly uh, commemorate all of the shuttle operations that were based in Kennedy Space Center, but, but they took the step to uh, acknowledge the losses in a, a very profound way uh, by creating a hall of remembrance with a memorial to each astronaut who lost uh, life on shuttle missions, and then to display portions of Challenger and Columbia as well. Um, because in the world of space flight, the vehicles are part of the family too, and people mourn the loss of the vehicles just as they mourned the loss of the crew. So, so I find this very moving, and they were able to do it um, there, I think, more naturally than we would have been able to do it in Washington because of the very history of their center. Uh, these are some other elements of nostalgia. Uh, you might remember that the NASA worm logo, which was invented for the shuttle era, 
uh, was retired in about 1992. Uh, it had proudly graced all NASA buildings, all NASA stationery, all NASA vehicles, and all of the orbiters at one time, but, but now you can hardly find it anywhere. Uh, it still exists on the Space Shuttle Enterprise, and it still is chiseled into the NASA headquarters building uh, at the cornerstone. So uh, it d did survive, but it's hard to find it anywhere else. It was pretty well eradicated. But it was another symbol of what NASA was trying to do in this new era, establish a different identity, and what better way to do that than with a new logo? Um, and the, uh, the final 30th, 30-year um, anniversary commemorative emblem, which probably many of you have, is also loaded with symbols that have meaning uh, as, as a graphical way to preserve the memory of the shuttle era. Uh, NASA commissioned uh, this cartoon from Brian Bassett, uh, and I think it uh, sums up what so many people feel. What a ride, uh, what a ride it was uh, during the space shuttle era. There was so much activity in space, and our meaning of space flight evolved during that period. But now we're in a period where the focus is back on going out to a destination. And Mars has been on the horizon for decades. Uh, it has been part of all of NASA's future-oriented strategic plans and studies. It's been part of science fiction. Uh, it's been in the world of films, movies, television shows. Uh, Mars beckons is a wonderful statement. I think we don't know yet for sure if we're going to get there um, in, uh, in the near future, and we don't know if we're going to get there by way of the moon or by way of asteroids uh, or by way of cislunar uh, missions. There, there is so much talk about all of these things, and, and NASA is certainly proceeding uh, with a new vehicle capable of going to the moon and a vehicle that could be the model to go to Mars uh, eventually. But I, I feel that the future is still uncertain. It's largely dependent on public consensus and political consensus. But we see increasingly the images that are altering our imaginary as we start thinking ahead to the next giant leap hearkening back to the Apollo era and the first words on the moon, will the next giant leap be on Mars? Will we have vehicles? Will we have habitats? Will we have geologists up there and other, other types of people studying Mars? May we eventually have uh, something like an encampment or even a colony on Mars and actually become an uh, interplanetary species Will, we, will some people leave Earth permanently? Uh, these are all different imaginaries, but they are where the logic of space flight leads us. Um, and I think we're gonna need to talk to uh, about these in new ways because I'm, as I said earlier, I'm not convinced that today's young people are as attuned to the frontier, the West, uh, as we were in our time, uh, they are really more attuned to fantasy, and they've been schooled in video games and films where uh, incredible things happen, and they happen so quickly, and spaceflight is essentially kind of an incremental, slow-as-you-go enterprise if you want it to be safe, and, and that's the way uh, we have proceeded, um, even during the Apollo era. We, though we did it within a decade, we also were doing it in a very methodical way. Um, the astronauts, I think, have kind of recognized in their role as the public face of NASA that they need to appeal to the public they speak to and reach in new ways. And in the latter part of the shuttle era, they started issuing posters like these that were based on popular movies as a way to kind of show we're part of 
the contemporary generation. You know, we want to appeal to you where you are. And people snap these up like crazy. Um, this is a roving vehicle that's under development at JSC. And uh, it's, it's new in many ways, but it kind of has a NASA look to it, don't you think? I mean, would you kind of guess, even if the logo were not on it, this might be a, a NASA product? Um, it's very sensible. It has a lot of features that would make roving on the moon or Mars and suiting up into a spacesuit to go EVA very easy. But Kennedy Space Center just hired a Disney-related firm to design a rover that they could send out on the road. Uh, to our museum, among other places, to kind of get people excited about Mars exploration or lunar exploration. And this is what we got. This is what, I mean, we were astonished when we saw this roll into the museum, because it doesn't look like anything NASA's ever designed. It looks, it looks more like something from a science fiction movie. And it had some practical features and some features that were not practical at all. But, I, I put these up here just to make the point that um, millennials and others may give us new imaginaries, new ways to think about space flight. Um, and they're the ones who are going to be doing the engineering and the scientific research as our generation retires. They've been schooled differently. They have grown up with devices in their hands that enable them to communicate instantly, to learn instantly. Uh, we don't know what the next evolutions of those technologies will be, but will they draw out of their cultural experience some new imaginary that will frame the purpose of spaceflight for going back out into the solar system and doing great things out there? as um, the shuttle did in our generation. And uh, I'm going to close by reading you just one more very brief passage. And I know I'm kind of getting into the book signing time, but um, and I, want to, I want to take a couple of questions. Um, do you? OK, so what I say in the introduction to the book is, after I've explained what my argument is and what kinds of sources I used. Um, I used newspapers, editorial cartoons, NASA files, notes for meetings, uh, memos to and from people within NASA. I mined the New York Times and the Washington Post especially. Um, but I said this exploration thus roams through four decades worth of thinking about and struggling with the meaning of human spaceflight. No single concept has become the foundation for a lasting consensus about why humans should or should not be sent into space. The most enduring of several imaginaries in the, um, is the frontier, which resonates for many older Americans who came of age in the mid-1900s. But this imaginary may not appeal to the younger generations for whom the frontier experience is at a distance and whose entertainment choices are fantasy computer games, not pioneer tales. It may be time to step outside the box of familiar metaphor and propose a radical new paradigm, a millennial imaginary that appeals to the values and traditions of 21st century generations, the ones who will have to decide whether or not human spaceflight continues. And not being a millennial, I can't propose what that imaginary might be, so I'm leaving it uh, to them to come up with and hope that it succeeds as well as the frontier imaginary and the uh, imaginary of routine spaceflight and research in space uh, worked. And I'll just close with my very favorite image of the entire space shuttle era, uh, which I just put up here because I love it. And I had actually thought it might be the cover of the book. But again, the publisher uh, outvoted me. Uh, but I love this um, because to me, it represents what 
truly is at the heart of space flight, apart from politics, economics, um, society, even culture. Uh, it represents the human being taking charge of destiny and doing something never done before, uh, going through the tremendous effort to do it, essentially to prove it can be done. And uh, I, I just think the experience of uh, seeing one person out there in space alone, not wholly detached from Earth, because he was still in communication, and um, he was dependent on technology for his survival, uh, the spacesuit and the man maneuvering unit, but inside that was a human being committed to do something exceptional and extraordinary. And, and I think that's, you know, that's really what's at the heart of our, our experience in spaceflight as a nation.